Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bethel this morning. We're going to begin our service by singing Oh, Praise the Name. If you'd stand and join us, please. one another this morning. Thank you. 
love that song. so good to praise your name because you are such a good and a faithful God. And every day you shower us with your blessings. We understand that the blessings you give us, we do not deserve, but we receive them because you are a gracious giver. You are a wonderful father to us. And it is a great reminder to us today to look every day to praise your name, to find the things that you've done for us and to acknowledge that because we never want to take for granted who you are or what you do for us. And it's good for us today to celebrate with one another your faithfulness. So thank you for that chance to remember today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can join me in turning to the book of Colossians, right in the middle of the New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Today we are finishing up this book uh, by the Apostle Paul, written to a church in Asia Minor, what is today the country of Turkey. Uh, I am jumping over some sections in chapter 3 about husbands and wives and children and servants because uh, we've looked at those passages, those verses, various times in the past. But today, we're going on to chapter 4. And here, Paul gives us some closing remarks as he finishes up this letter. Colossians chapter 4, I'm going to start reading in verse 2. I'll be reading out of the New International Version. If you have a different translation, the wording may be just a little bit different. It says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke the doctor and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, See to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Let's pray together. Father, we are blessed to have this book of Colossians in your word, and we have seen and been reminded of so many great truths as we have gone through this book. And now as we come to this final chapter and we see the names and it's easy to think this is trivial and this is unimportant for us, but you have great lessons for us to learn from this chapter. And for each one of us today, we may come away with a different lesson, something different that you speak to each one of us about. And so, Lord, our desire, our, our desire is for you to work in our hearts today. Speak to us. Uh, open the eyes of our hearts to see the truth of what your word not just what it says, but what it means for us, how we can apply your truth to our, our life. And we need the help of your Holy Spirit to do that for us. So we pray today that your Holy Spirit would be at work among us. We know you're here with us, and we celebrate your presence. We pray that we would be changed because of what we see in your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. As Paul finishes this letter to his friends he has never met, He reminds them of one of our key resources as Christians, which is prayer. And Paul does not just call them to pray, 
but he calls them to be devoted to prayer. One of the greatest weapons in the Christian's arsenal, one of the most powerful forces that God has given to us, is one that often goes unused. We often think, well, you know, if I just knew the Bible better, if I knew Greek and Hebrew and could look at the original text, I'd know all these great secrets for getting victory over sin. But God has made it so much simpler for us. He has given us the resource of prayer. God says, ask me and I'll give it to you. Ask me and I will do this for you. Now, the phrase here, be devoted, really is the idea of holding on tenaciously to something, holding on dearly to something. Think about someone drowning in a lake, and they can't swim, and the lifeguard takes the life preserver and throws it out. They grab it, and they hold on dearly. They're holding on for dear life, to that life preserver. They cling to it with all their might. I've shared before with you about the first time I went rappelling. I was down in North Carolina and when I was in college and my good friend Ron had been in the Marines and he loved to go rappelling and we had a day off classes. He said, hey, let's go up to the mountain and go rappelling. I'd never been before, but I said, sure, let's go. And so we... uh, drive up to the top of the sheer rock face. Just getting there is a story in itself uh, of how we got up the mountain face. But we get up to the top, and Ron takes out this little one-inch rope, and he hooks it up to me, and then he wraps the, the rope to his pickup truck. And I'm thinking, I know all about leverage and force, and I'm thinking, I don't know about that. You know, the further down I get, is that going to hold? He said, don't worry, I'll tie it to the tree too. So he ties it to the tree. And so he said, I'll go down first, and then I'll holler and you come down. So he went down, he said, okay, come on. And so I get to that edge of the rock face, and I am holding on for dear life. And he said, okay, lean back. And I'm, I'm starting to lean, and I am clutching onto that rope and trying to get back because when you get to that rock face, you're here and you start going over the edge. When you have a healthy respect of heights, that is a difficult spot to be in. And so I got over the edge after who knows how many minutes, and now I'm parallel to the rock face, uh, or perpendicular to the rock face, just sticking out, And I am crawling, inching my way down, holding on for dear life. Got down to the bottom, and I let go of that rope, and my hands are just pulsing uh, because I was clutching so dearly. Now, the truth is, I had nothing to fear as long as I'm on that rope because that rope was holding me. I didn't have to struggle I didn't have to hold on so tight. I just needed to stay connected to the rope. And so we went back up to the top, and that time I learned I could trust a rope. It went a lot better the second time down. And after a couple times, I am jumping out, free-falling 20 feet and coming back into the rock, bouncing out, free-falling, coming back down. And I had a ball when I learned I could trust the rope. Now... We need to hold on for dear life to prayer. Paul tells us, be devoted to prayer. Not just when you're at the end of your rope. So many times people say, boy, if it got, it got so bad, I, I just had to pray about it. Prayer is not something to save as a last resort. Rather, it is something that we should be doing all day, every day. Paul tells us in another place, pray without ceasing doesn't mean I can't do anything. I have to pray all the time. No, but throughout the day, whatever we're doing, we're constantly remembering the Lord is with us and turning to him for help and seeking his guidance and blessing. Prayer should be part of who we are. Prayer should be a delight for us when we learn that God is the one who is holding on to us. 
He keeps us from falling as long as we stay connected to him. It's the relationship and communication with the one who loves us. I wouldn't think of coming home to Rhonda and not saying a word to her all night long. Because if you're with somebody you love, you want to talk with them, you want to share with them, you share your life with them. In the same way, prayer is talking to God, not just asking for things, but sharing our hearts, sharing our fears, our anxieties, our worries, sharing all of our thoughts for the future, listening to what God has to say to us. Prayer should be a joy for us. So many times Christians view prayer as a task, a chore. But it should be a joy when we remember that prayer is our staying connected to our God. Now notice what this verse tells us about prayer. Prayer takes concentration. Paul writes, being watchful. Have you ever fallen asleep when you're praying? We all have. We all have. Uh, But before you start beating yourself up over it, remember Jesus' disciples did also. But if we are going to be devoted to prayer, it's going to take some concentration of our energies. That means that when we pray, it should be more than just a quick, a quick 20-second prayer at meals or a quick 20-second prayer before bed. If you're really going to share your heart with somebody, it takes some effort. Uh, we need to make prayer a priority. So prayer takes concentration. Prayer also involves gratitude. Paul says being watchful and thankful. Think about the way we pray. We often say, dear Lord, and and in Jesus' name, amen. And in between, we tell them all the things we want. Please do this for me. Please do this for me. Please give me this. And please help this person do this. Think about if your child came in and said, hi, Dad. Give me $10. Can I have a chocolate bar? Can I have the car keys, please? And while I'm out, can you do my laundry for me? Thanks. Bye. Now, sad thing is that is how many kids talk to their parents these days. But when we talk to our God in prayer, it should be much more than just a wish list. And one of the key things we want to do is give thanks to God, to thank him for all he has done for us. What has God done for you lately? Have you thanked him for it? What has God, what dangers has God kept you from? I know when I got up and the power was still on the next morning, first thing out of my mouth was to thank God that the power didn't go out. Tell God how thankful you are when you pray. Our God has blessed us so abundantly And yet we so often fail to give him thanks. So when we pray, let's remember to come with thankfulness in our hearts. Then Paul teaches us a third lesson about prayer. Prayer involves others. If you look at verses 3 and 4 here, Paul's desire is that the gospel would be spread. So many times our prayers are focused on ourselves and our immediate family or those we love. And we fail to keep priorities in mind. How how much time do we really spend praying for those who have not come to place their faith in Christ? Uh, If you will be committed to praying for an unsaved relative, an unsaved neighbor, an unsaved co-worker, you will find that they're on your mind a whole lot more. You will find that you are aware when God gives you an open door to talk to them. So if we really want to see God's kingdom advance, we need to be praying for open doors, doors of opportunity, so that we can tell others about God. Don't just pray for the pastor to be a good witness. Don't just pray for our missionaries to share the gospel. Pray that God would give each one of us opportunities to tell others about how wonderful our God is. So, Paul's first closing call to us here in Colossians 4 is to be devoted to prayer. 
Secondly, Paul tells us, be wise in witnessing. Paul has just gotten, gotten done asking for their prayers that he could share the gospel effectively. But now in verse 5, he's going to bring it back to each one of the Colossian Christians. He wants them to be wise in the way that they relate to the unsaved. Sad thing is, so many times Christians have poor testimonies around others. And so it's no wonder they're reluctant to talk to them about the Lord because their life is such a poor example. So what does Paul tell us about our witnessing? First of all, he says, seize every opportunity. Uh, if you've ever heard the phrase, carpe diem, seize the day. The King James Version here has the phrase, redeeming the time. We make the most of every opportunity God gives us to share the gospel with others. When we are aware, praying, thinking about sharing with others, you'll find that God oftentimes will actually open the door and let them ask questions. They'll say something like, hey, I know you go to church. What do you think about such and so? And it's like God just gives us that open door and they even bring up the topic and we're able to jump right in. So we want to seize the day, seize every opportunity. Paul also tells us, though, as we relate to non-Christians, to speak with grace. We show Christ by the way we relate to others. Paul tells us in verse 6, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. And the perfect example of graciousness for us, we see in Jesus. When we read in the Gospels, we see the Pharisees, the religious, liter religious leaders of the day, but they were the hypocrites. They were the ones that nobody liked. But when we look at Jesus and the grace that exuded from Jesus, everybody wanted to be around Jesus. Everyone wanted to hear what he had to say. He loved people of all kinds and shapes and sizes. He told people to love their neighbors and anyone around them just like they love themselves. And even though his own neighbors rejected him, yet he still loved them. Children would run to sit on his lap. The crippled had hearts that skipped a beat when they saw him coming because Jesus gave them hope. Jesus touched them and talked to them. Yes, Jesus loves us. It's one of the first songs we learn as children, and it still strengthens our hearts today. He befriended the sick without a thought of falling. He sat down with the, the drunkards, but never made a selfish or foolish move. He moved toward other people that many ran away from. Do we show that same type of grace and kindness to others? Do we take time to meet their needs, or do we like to talk more about ourselves? Do we condemn them? Ah, oh, you know, you need to trust Jesus, you're going to burn in hell. Or do we truly show them love? Jesus was the perfect example of grace, and Paul reminds us, in our lives, we want to be full of grace as well. So be devoted to prayer, be wise in witnessing, and thirdly, work as a team. Work as a team. In these last verses in chapter 4, Paul shows us his team. And he, uh, it's almost like he sends a verbal photograph. He talks about each one who is part of his ministry. And he gives us a little bit of insight into each one. So, instead of just jumping over those names, let's think about them briefly this morning. First, we see Tychicus here, a man with a servant's heart. Verse 7, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. So what do we know about Tychicus? Say, well, that verse doesn't tell me a whole lot. 
That's where we compare Scripture with Scripture. Back in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20, we see that Tychicus joins the Apostle Paul when he goes to Jerusalem. And then we see Titus 3.12 tells us that Paul is sending Tychicus to Crete to take Titus's place. And Titus goes and visits Paul in Rome. Then we come to 2 Timothy 4.12, and Paul is sending Tychicus to Ephesus to fill in for Timothy, another young preacher, so that Timothy can go and see Paul. And so Tychicus is making a career out of filling whatever the need is, just filling in as an interim minister. Uh, hey, Titus, I'm here. Paul wants to see you. Timothy, I'm here to cover for you. Go see Paul. While Paul is in prison writing letters, he sends them out to the churches through Tychicus. And so Tychicus ends up delivering the letters of Philemon, Colossians, and Ephesians. But he's not just a delivery man, he's an encourager as well. If you look at verse 8, I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. So Tychicus is a great servant. Say, hey, Paul, you have something you need done? I'm your man. I'm here to do it. But he's also encouraging others the whole time. Great example for us. When there's a need, make yourself available to be used, but at the same token, always seek to be encouraging others while you're doing it. Next we see Onesimus, the man with a sinful past. Verse 9, he's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. They will tell you everything that's happening here. So what do we know about Onesimus? We find his story in the book of Philemon. Paul writes to Philemon, a wealthy landowner, a wealthy slave owner, and Philemon had a slave named Onesimus who ran away. And reading between the lines, it looks like he may have robbed his master as well because Paul says, hey, if he owes you anything, I'll cover the bill. He ends up meeting Paul and coming to faith in Christ. And Paul, as he writes Philemon, says, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. But receive him as a brother in Christ. And it's interesting of how God worked in Onesimus' life. Not from the Bible, but from early church history. There was a letter written by Ignatius, one of the early church fathers. And in that letter, Ignatius, who was pastor of the church at Smyrna, remember we see that in the book of Revelation, writes these words. Since then, in the name of God, I received your entire congregation in the person of Onesimus, a man of inexpressible love, and your pastor, I beseech you in Christ Jesus to love him and all who are like him. So it appears from this that Onesimus, this runaway slave, comes back to his master. And now that he's come to faith in Christ, and he ends up becoming the pastor of the Colossian church. It's a great ending to a great story. Philemon takes him back, and Onesimus ends up being his pastor of the church there. Never let your past keep you from serving God. I love what the singer Carmen used to say. He says, whenever Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. <laughs> because we know that God is able to use us regardless of our past. And Onesimus is a perfect example and reminder for us of that. The third of Paul's partners is mentioned in verse 10. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings. Aristarchus is a man with a sympathetic heart. In Acts chapter 27, we see that Paul gets on a boat to go to Rome as a prisoner. He is going there to be tried. To, he appeals before Caesar. And Acts 27 2 tells us that when he got on the boat, Aristarchus was with him. So Aristarchus travels with Paul, stays with Paul, while Paul is in prison in Rome. 
Sometimes you may feel like, well, I don't have a whole lot of gifts to use in ministry. But many times, the greatest ministry we can have is to be a companion to somebody. When someone is going through a difficult time, they may not need somebody to give them a lot of teaching. They just need somebody to be there with them. And that was Aristarchus. He was there with Paul. He probably wasn't a prisoner, but he is spending his time in prison with Paul, ministering to his needs. Then in that same verse, we see Mark, the man with a second chance. Say, where do we know Mark from? Back to the book of Acts once again. During Paul's first missionary journey, Mark went along with Paul and Barnabas but he ended up going home early. So when Paul is ready to take a second trip and go back and visit all those churches he had started again, Barnabas wanted to take Mark along with him. Paul says, no way, and they end up splitting up, going their separate ways. And so here we are years later, and Paul says in verse 10, you have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. It might have been easy for the church to dismiss Mark because of his previous failings. But Paul gives him a second chance now. As Paul is writing Philemon during the same time period, he names Mark as one of his fellow workers. So what turned Mark's life around and made him profitable again? Encouragement that he received from other Christians. Uh, Barnabas, we are told, is his cousin. And Barnabas is the son of encouragement. He is a great encourager. But we also see Mark mentioned in 1 Peter 5, 13, where it says, Your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. So Peter, who has known his share of failure, remember how Peter denies the Lord three times, Peter comes alongside Mark, who has experienced failure, and gives him encouragement, and takes him in a uh, father-son relationship, and invests in his life. So it makes us think, not just, what second chance do I need, but whose life can I invest into? We all need to be looking for individuals to pour ourselves into. Those who need some encouragement. Those who need somebody to come alongside them and uh, help them to see the good things that God can do in their lives. Then next we meet Jesus Justice in verse 11. Boy, how would you like to be named Jesus? Uh, it's a tall reputation to live up to. Jesus, who was called Justice, also sends greetings. So here's a man with a great commitment. The name justice means the righteous one. So apparently, Jesus, who is called justice, he has a nickname. Oh, Jesus, the righteous one. He has such a godly life that they call him the righteous one. It would be wonderful if each one of us lived in such a way that people gave us nicknames based on our godliness, our righteousness. But notice what verse 11 also tells us about him. It says, These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have provided, proved a comfort to me. So Aristarchus, Mark, and Jesus' justice are Jews, and they are the only Jews who have comforted Paul at this time. Say, well, what about those other names? They're Gentiles. They're Greeks or Romans. But here are three Jews who have stood by Paul. So Jesus, justice, is a Jew. And to identify with Paul meant courageously taking a stand with Paul against all the other Jews in the area. So Jesus, justice, is a committed, courageous man. Another co-worker we see in verse 12, Epaphras the man with a single passion. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. 
He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. So we mentioned Epaphras when we were back in chapter 1 of Colossians, where in verse 7 it says, You learned the gospel from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. So Epaphras is the founder of the church at Colossae, most likely its pastor at the time. But he doesn't have a heart just for his city, but for two neighboring cities, Laodicea and Hierapolis. And notice that Epaphras is not just praying. It says, he is always wrestling in prayer for you. He has a passion to see God work in these communities. And what does he want to see? Spiritual maturity. He says, he's always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. When we pray for others, we want to go beyond just praying for their physical ailments. And we want to pray for their spiritual maturity, for them to grow to be spiritually mature in Christ Jesus. Next is a familiar name to us in verse 14, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. So Luke is the man with a specialized talent. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, if I could just go to seminary and learn like Pastor Dean did, then I could be useful. But look at Luke. He wasn't a preacher. He didn't go to seminary. But he was a doctor, a medical doctor. And it reminds us that God uses people with all kinds of talents and skills in ministry. Luke travels with Paul, tending to his health, giving encouragement to his soul. And then God uses Luke to go on and write two books of the Bible, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Never underestimate how God might use your gifts in ministry. Then in the group of co-workers, we find a discouraging note, which is Demas, the man with a sad future. While Demas is sending his greetings as he's partnering with Paul here, in just a short time, a few years later, Paul will write this about him, in 2 Timothy 4, 9. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. We always need to guard our hearts lest we allow the things of the world to draw us away from our commitment to serving Christ. When I went to college, there were many other young men from my church who claimed to have a call to ministry and who went off to Bible college, but ended up never going into ministry, going back and serving, starting a lawn mowing business or becoming an auto mechanic or any of a number of other things. Let's realize that we always need to watch our hearts so that we not allow things of the world to distract us from fulfilling the call that God has given us. In verse 16, we see that the early church used to share these letters of Paul and pass them around to one another. They didn't have photocopy machines back then or faxes or email or anything like that, so they would send the actual letters that Paul sent and share them with the other churches. They were called circular letters. And before we're done, there's one more name to note in verse 17. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. What was his work? We don't know. But think about this, the impact this letter would have on him. Paul is writing and says, Archippus, here are all these faithful workers. Now make sure that you are faithful as well. We look at our our lives. We read this chapter and we hear of all these faithful workers and we also want to say the same thing. I want to be faithful as well in fulfilling the work God has given me to do. So today, what is the work God has prepared you to do? Don't shrink back from it. Don't think it's too much for you to handle. Don't think, well, somebody else will do it. Just look to God to give you the power 
to complete the work that God has given to you. Look for the open doors that God gives you and then step through them in his strength. Just like all these faithful partners of Paul we see here in Colossians 4. So here are three keys of Colossians 4, keys to help us in our daily lives. Be devoted in prayer, be wise in witnessing, and work as a team. May God help us in each of these three areas. Let's pray together. Father, today we are so thankful that you have given us the privilege of prayer. You invite us to come boldly before your throne and find grace to help in time of need. Help us, Lord, always to be committed to sharing our hearts and our thoughts and our lives with you in prayer. Help us, Lord, always to be looking for opportunities to share with others. And thank you, Lord, that we can work together as a team in ministry. We thank you for our brothers and sisters here in this church and the way that we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. These are some great reminders for us here in Colossians 4, and we thank you for what we've seen. We pray that you would help us each to apply these truths to our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand and join us as once more we sing praises. It has been a joy to gather together and praise the name of the Lord together. Thank you for coming today. Take some time to greet one another before you go. You are dismissed.